Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's Medicine Grand Rounds is the, uh, is the 2020 Fialco Scholar Award Rounds. And uh, the uh, Fialco Scholar Award was established in memory of, of Philip and Helen Fialco in 1997. And the Department of Medicine established this award in recognition and support of a junior faculty member who shows outstanding promise as a scholar. Uh, the Fialcos were very, uh, had a uh, keen interest in the um, mentorship and development of junior faculty. And they, uh, we wanted to identify mechanisms to promote understanding scholarship with this award. This is the highest award uh, that we give to uh, junior faculty in the Department of Medicine. Next, uh, next slide, please. I should also add that uh, Dr. Fialco was a, the former chair of the Department of Medicine and then also the Dean of the School of Medicine. And he and his wife, Helen, passed away tragically uh, in Nepal from an avalanche while they were on a trekking expedition. The award was established in 1997. Here's a list of the past, uh, past awardees. And uh, today's uh, or this year's awardee is Dr. Benjamin Urbino Friedman from the Division of Nephrology. And I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Raj Mahotra, who's the division head of nephrology to introduce Bino. Thanks, Conrad. It is my pleasure to introduce Bino. Um, Bino is a member of the Division of Nephrology, investigator at the Kidney Research Institute. Uh, he did his PhD at UC Berkeley and then went on as a postdoc to work in the lab of Joe Bonventry. We were fortunate to recruit him in 2015 to the University of Washington. Uh, and he's done amazingly well. Uh, in a very short period of five years, he is now an associate professor in the Division of Nephrology, um, a very rapid rise that is a testament uh, to the scientific work that he has done. Uh, his lab is interested in understanding how kidneys grow, how this knowledge can be applied to guide the development of new therapies. And he studies these questions in human kidney organoids. And you'll hear more about this, I'm sure, in his presentation using genome editing techniques. Uh, he's started off in focusing with polycystic kidney disease and has gradually expanded to study this in cystinosis, glomerular disease, acute kidney injury, and kidney regeneration. Uh, his work is supported by multiple federal grants that are our level or equivalent and grants from numerous foundations. Um, and I think, you know, in all the contributions that Bino has made already, I think he has many more to make in the years to come. Uh, and we're very proud of all that he's accomplished and for which he's recognized nationally and increasingly internationally. So on to Bino now. Well, thank you so much, Raj and Conrad for these very kind words. And it's really my great honor to accept this award in memory of the Fialcos. And I'm very grateful to everybody involved in this and to the committee as well. And it's, uh, you know, I know this is a competitive award. There's many, many worthy people uh, within our department. And I'm just uh, very touched that you guys chose to recognize our lab's work on this occasion. So we do have some disclosures and uh, these are described here. And the topic of my talk today is developing next generation renal therapeutics with human kidney organoids. And I wanted to just start out for me that this, this is really a year when medicine touched me in a, in a way that it had not before. Um, and uh, you know, this is a picture of a recent lab meeting where you can see some of our lab members are at home, others are in the lab masked up, and this is uh, the new normal for everybody. You know, we're all as a, a race uh, more aware now than we were before of how important it is to stay healthy and safe. And this is a picture of, of my family at the zoo where we're also uh, wearing masks, being able to take our toddler out. So I want to start with a thank you to everybody, uh, particularly our frontline workers as well as our critical personnel who are uh, keeping us safe during this time and uh, keeping everything going and doing research on this uh, sudden pandemic. And you know, I, I, on a personal note, we're all getting a taste of what it feels like to be a patient 
And uh, this is also a sobering experience for me. I'm not a physician, uh, but medicine does run in my family. And uh, this is a picture of my, my grandfather, my late grandfather, Melvin Friedman, uh, who is a family practitioner. And uh, this is a picture of my, my parents, Mark, who is a uh, family practitioner like his father before, and my mother, Linda, who is a PhD in, in social work. And I feel very privileged that I was brought up in this environment that uh, respected medicine, prized medicine, and uh, research as well, and encouraged me to follow my own interests. And for me as a child, this was uh, really about the power of biology and nature and animals. And one of these papers that really inspired me, in fact, the first paper I ever read, first scientific paper I ever read, was this one by Wilman et al showing the, the cloning of Dolly the sheep. And I thought, wow, this is an amazing thing where they can take the DNA of a single cell, put it in the, the egg cell of a sheep and grow a new sheep that's an identical twin of the original DNA. And this inspired me to study regeneration as an undergraduate. And uh, I was very fortunate to land in the Heber Katz laboratory at UPenn where we were studying regeneration in the mouse and, and Dr. Heber Katz, who's pictured here, uh, allowed me to do these fun experiments. And um, after that, it inspired me to go on to my PhD in, in Dr. Rebecca Heald's lab at UC Berkeley, where I was studying these egg cells and what their properties were that were allowing DNA to change and become remodeled. And I really credit my, uh, my love of science to these, these two uh, mentors of mine uh, at this early stage without whom I, I would not be at where I am today. Now at the end of my PhD, I, I became more aware of medicine primarily thanks to my uncle. And my uncle is pictured here with his family. And this is after his second kidney transplant. And, and my uncle had been living with kidney disease essentially his entire life. And this at the time when I was graduating, he needed a second transplant. And this, this brought my awareness to kidney disease. And it's not just my uncle, it's, it's an estimated 30 million people in the United States who, who have some form of kidney disease or are at risk for kidney disease. And this amounts to $114 billion of expenditures in Medicare costs. And we have, we have thank God we have therapies, including kidney transplantation and hemodialysis, um, but these are, therapies that are going on 70 years now without fundamental updates, and they do have side effects and limitations, including shortages. So this brought my love of stem cells to think that maybe we could use stem cells to clone an organ instead of a sheep. So today I'm going to talk about where we are on that idea, and, and I'm going to start with an intro to the kidney organoid and how we're using this to recreate human disease in the lab, and then finally the future of this work. And the idea, the strategy towards cloning a kidney is this picture shown here, which is a therapeutic cycle of human stem cells where thanks to uh, Nobel Prize winning technologies, uh, we are able to take adult cells from a patient, and these could be derived from a humble urine sample, and introduce into these stem cell genes and growth signals that turn back the clock on these adult cells and change them into pluripotent cells, which exist normally only uh, before any of the organs in our bodies have formed. And these are powerful cells. And we have figured out ways to direct these cells into a variety of organ lineages, and most notably recently the kidney. And we can use these mini kidney structures or organoids for therapeutics discovery and precision medicine applications in the lab. And we can also envision taking these structures and making more complex grafts that would be safe for transplantation into the original patient where they would be 100% match and could be generated on demand. So to, to do this work after my PhD, I, I needed to find a lab that was interested in the same thing. And I was very fortunate to uh, uh, be recruited to the Brigham and Women's Hospital to work in the laboratory of, of Dr. Joseph Bonventry. Uh, and I was paired with a partner in crime, uh, a young 
physician scientist, Albert Lamb. And together, uh, we unlocked some of the early signals to change iPS cells into the kidney lineage. So this is a new thing, you know, for years, we'd been able to make heart and, and liver and other types of lineages from iPS cells, but we had not yet cracked the nut of creating kidney. And we discovered that this GSK3 beta inhibitor called Chiro99021 really helped drive the pluripotent iPS cells into the mesendoderm lineage, which is the developmental tissue that precedes the kidney. And using this Chiro molecule, we were able to get these cells to a relatively advanced stage where they were beginning to form these structures that we call renal vesicles, which are this, the beginnings of tubules in the kidney. Now to really take this work forward and further develop it, uh, I needed a, a larger lab and, 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 a, and really a growth niche uh, for this, this seed of an idea to develop. And I was again, very fortunate to, uh, uh, to meet and be recruited to the University of Washington. And uh, these, these gentlemen here are primarily responsible, Dr. Stuart Shankland, who was until recently the chief of the division of nephrology and Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb, who is the director of the Kidney Research Institute. So both of them bring to bear, you know, a wonderful division and a wonderful institute that create a great environment. And this is further paired with our Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, led by Dr. Chuck Murray, as well as Hanala Ruhola Baker, who was my neighbor lab for the past five years. And uh, all of this is in the great larger institution of the University of Washington Department of Medicine, uh, led uh, formerly by Dr. Bill Bremner and currently uh, by Barbara Jung. And, uh, and also Conrad Lyles has been really very helpful in this entire recruitment process. And I'll point out as well that I, I really feel part of the family at the University of Washington. And uh, indeed my family is part of the university as well. So this is Dr. Hong Shafu, who's an assistant professor now in the division of hematology as well. And this has created a tremendous growth environment for this work. And shortly after I was recruited, uh, we published this uh, important paper that described for the first time how to take these iPS cells and drive them further into what we now call kidney organoids. And uh, the essential step is to treat with a high dose of the GSK3 beta inhibitor and subsequently allow these cells to self-assemble and self-organize. And when they do this, they form these tubular structures that you can see here by phase contrast microscopy arising over 17 days in culture. And when we stained these tubules, which we'd never seen the likes of before in iPS cell cultures, uh, we found that they form these intricate and complex uh, three-dimensional structures that are composed of many different cell types, including podocytes, which are in here in red, and these, these are the filtering cells of the kidney connecting to proximal tubules, which are uh, the next in line absorptive cells of the kidney, and uh, further on to a distal tubular segment. And these complex structures were arising in the same type of proximal to distal axis that we see in kidney tissue. Now, five years on, uh, I'll just point out that this protocol that we have established remains essentially the same, and it's now been licensed by stem cell technologies uh, nearby in Vancouver so that the whole world can use it to generate these structures. So I've said the word organoid, but I wanted to define this word because it's not a common word in our vernacular. So what's an organoid really? And uh, the idea here is that this is a multicellular structure in a dish that resembles a tissue or organ of the body. And the kidney is just the latest addition to a pantheon of these types of structures that have been established from stem cells or even from adult cells uh, by growing them in specialized culture conditions. And these include intestine, brain, retina, pancreas, liver. And when you look at these structures, you might think that you're looking at an actual tissue, but ac it's actually just biology in a dish that's coming together and forming a sum that's greater than the whole, uh, or a, greater, a, a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. 
And it's not just a structural semblance that we're after, uh, but also a functional resemblance. And to test whether our kidney organoids could perform any functions of the kidney, uh, we've added into these uh, cultures various types of small molecules and dyes. And you can see here the accumulation of a dextran dye within the kidney tubules. And uh, if I play these movies here, you'll be able to see it better that these organoids under flow accumulate soluble factors that are provided to their environment, including glucose. So we can see these functions of the kidney. And remember the kidneys are essentially there most of the time to reabsorb things back into the body at just the right amounts and just get rid of the stuff that, that the body doesn't need. And we can see this function beginning to take place uh, in a dish within our organoids. Now, why do we want to use these complex structures in a dish? I think one of the great advantages is that we can miniaturize them and now we can perform experiments at a much larger scale than we could before by separating them out into many different conditions. And rather than try to explain this myself, I'm going to play a clip that was uh, made after a, one of our papers by a news, a, a news reporter. And I think she eloquently explains the idea here. New at seven, robots and research underway right now at the University of Washington may someday save your life. Scientists are using those robots to help make thousands of miniature kidneys every day with a goal of curing kidney disease. Guy Rosem's Joanna Small went inside that lab to find out how it works. This is our main lab. Benjamin Friedman is a scientist, but he might not be if it weren't for his uncle. The thing that really got me into it is actually that my uncle had kidney disease at the time. I was thinking we've got to use these stem cell technologies to uh, find a way to find better therapies for people with this disease. So for the last decade, Friedman has been researching kidney disease. They have to be cultured. And in 2015, he had a breakthrough at the University of Washington using microscopic stem cells. And with the help from robots, he grows kidneys, thousands and thousands and thousands of kidneys. There are 384 stem cell samples in each one of these trays. On the other side, you have a tiny pin with an even tinier opening. What you see the robot doing is taking a compound and adding it to each one of the stem cell samples. And that is how a mini organ comes to fruition. They're faster, they can handle larger numbers and they're more accurate than human beings. Once that transfer is done, then we take those and they go into an incubator. It takes three weeks to develop a mini organ, and they're so small, you can only see them under a microscope that magnifies the images by roughly 1,000. We zoom in, each one of these wells contains several of these mini kidney organoids. Small structures. So what do Friedman and his team do with them? Well, the answer is twofold. That's where we're using these little mini organs for what we call clinical trials in a dish to try to figure out what drugs can help cure different kidney diseases. For example, these kidneys are visible to the naked eye because they've been injected with a disease that makes the organ swell. These have not been treated with drugs. We're just letting them grow to study how they behave. The other application may be even more impressive. The wait for a kidney transplant is long and arduous, and even those lucky enough to receive a compatible one. Eventually they do wear out. It's not like if you get a kidney transplant, it lasts forever. You have to get another one after about 10 or 15 years, because your body attacks it no matter what you do. But this technology is essentially growing a kidney, just like the one you have, a clone, yeah. only healthy. Yeah, our bodies will be very happy with our own cells. They just will reject cells from other people. They have done some implanting in animals. Have you had positive results? Uh, not to this point. So. Yet, Friedman says, that's not so far off. If we do well, we could potentially start trials in humans in about 10 years. That's about the time his uncle will need a new kidney. He waited five years for his first one, and that was five years ago. Oh, if, he, if this works, it will change for him and for many others. And there's so many people who are in need of these transplants. At the University of Washington School of Medicine, Joanna Small, Cairo 7 News. And a, a quick shout out to 
uh, the UW Medicine media team, which, which made that possible. Uh, they've really done a great job over the years of getting the word out about our research. So I, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna delve into a couple of these ideas in more detail. And the first part of it is really using gene editing CRISPR technology to recreate forms of human disease. And the focus of our work primarily, at least in the early years, has been on polycystic kidney disease. And this is a very common and complex disease. And you can see here how kidneys with PKD appear compared to a healthy kidney. It's an enlarged kidney. And those tiny tubules have swollen up and formed these large balloon-like sacs of fluid called cysts. We've known the genes that caused this disease for about 30 years. And these are PKD1 or PKD2. And this is a common disease in that it affects one in every 600 people on the planet. Um, but we, we, and we know that these genes encode these large transmembrane proteins that self-assemble at the primary cilium, which is an antenna-like complex in epithelial cells. But we don't exactly know what this complex does that when it's deficient, uh, results in cyst formation. And one of the big barriers here is that cell lines from patients don't form cysts in a very specific way. So they either form cysts, even if they're not from PKD patients, or uh, you know, in some cases, the cells from a PKD patient won't form cysts unless they're in, under very specific conditions. And I was lucky in developing this model that I had a couple of great mentors with a lot of experience in PKD uh, at, at Brigham and Women's. And these are uh, Jing Zhao and uh, Ted Steinman. So to try to model PKD in our organoid system, we needed a very clean technology where we could compare cells that had the mutations versus ones that didn't. And at that time, there was a new technology that had just been introduced called CRISPR-Cas9. And uh, this allows for us to make specific cuts just at a particular location within the genome and introduce mutations there. So it's kind of like a word search for DNA, as you can see illustrated on the right side. As we're typing in nucleotide bases, we're narrowing down on a specific sequence within the PKD2 gene. And in this way, we were able to introduce mutations specifically in that gene of interest. And we did this for both PKD1 and PKD2 and confirmed that our resultant stem cells were missing the proteins that are associated with this disease. And then we turned them into organoids. And initially we didn't see any difference between our mutants and the controls, which were otherwise identical besides for those mutations. But then we noticed that as these cells continued to grow, a small number of the tubules in the mutant organoids would detach from the dish and form these little balloon structures that looked like cysts. It wasn't happening in a lot of them, but it was striking because it was specific to the mutants and was not observed in our isogenic controls. So when I came to the University of Washington, uh, I recruited Dr. Nellie Cruz, uh, who had done her graduate work at MIT. And she was interested in this detachment event that was associated with the cyst formation. So she manually removed organoids from the dishes and placed them in a suspension culture as shown here on the right. And when Nellie did this, she saw a dramatic increase in the number of cysts that were forming specifically in our PKD organoids. And these organoids could actually grow and continue to grow for months in culture so that we got these large structures, as you can see on the right here, that uh, were full of fluid, just like they are in the actual disease. And these structures were expanding thousands of times in size compared to the original organoids. And in some cases they've gotten so big that we've had to remove them from these culture plates and culture them in bottles. And they can last for more than a year. And you can see how big these can actually get. So a striking recapitulation of the disease phenotype. And this was very exciting because as I said before, we didn't have a human in vitro model of PKD before this time. So we were struck by the importance of microenvironment in promoting the formation of the cysts. And we then turned to our chemical screening platform that I introduced earlier to try to understand what was the molecular mechanism underlying this sensitivity to microenvironment. And we tested a number of drugs that affected factors 
in the neighborhood of the organoids. And we found that this drug, blebistatin, was really the only one that showed a significant effect. And what it did was greatly increase the size and number of these cysts. And this was really specific to the PKD organoids in that it didn't have as strong an effect on the controls. So what is blebistatin? Blebistatin is an inhibitor of myosin. Myosin is a contractile protein. We normally think about it in muscles, but in this case, it was affecting these kidney tubules. So we looked to see if there were any myosins that were expressed in our organoids. And indeed, we found that there were non-muscle myosin proteins that were expressed. And these seem to be highly expressed within these PKD cysts, which gave us the idea that maybe this was a target for polycystic kidney disease. So Louisa Helms, who's a very talented PhD program in our laboratory has been now picked up this project. And she's asking the question, could we now, rather than blocking myosin and making cysts work worse, activate myosin to make the cysts better? And uh, she's discovered EMD, which is a myosin activator compound, which has essentially been forgotten about. It was originally developed uh, for therapies in the heart, but we're now applying it to our kidney organoids and Luisa has shown that in a dose dependent way, when you add EMD to our organoids and activate myosin, it dramatically rescues the effects that we were seeing in our PKD organoids so that these cysts are barely detectable. And importantly, uh, Luisa has also performed toxicity analysis and shown that these doses that are rescuing the cyst formation are also safe in the organoids and not causing some sort of uh, toxic event that would preclude this pathway's use. Courtney Vichy, another PhD student in the lab, is, and she's actually an MD PhD student, uh, is also working to expand our toolbox to rescue PKD. And we found for certain uses, organoids are great, but for other uses, we might want to use a simpler system. And these are actually proximal tubular cells that Courtney has engineered that lack polycystin two. And when she grows these proximal tubular cells, she finds that they not only lack polycystin two, but they also lack a partner, polycystin one. And impressively, when we add a proteasome inhibitor, which blocks the de degradation of proteins, we're able to rescue the polycystin one expression in these polycystin two knockout lines. So Courtney is now going back to the organoid system to see if this proteasome inhibitor treatment can rescue cyst formation. And this is a second example of how we've now gotten a drug that seems to help a PKD specific phenotype. So now where are we going with this technology? And I wanted to start by pointing out that patients and partners are also playing a starring role in our basic research activities in a way that I never really thought uh, was possible. And I've got some pictures here to demonstrate this. This is uh, the Noack Macklin family, which has generously initiated a fund to support research into polycystic kidney disease. And these are, this is the whole group uh, you know, celebrating the initiation of this fund, which is in honor of Lara Macklin, uh, who is a Seattle resident as well. Uh, on the right, you see a microscope that our lab has now purchased and is using as a workhorse tool, which was gifted by the Mount Baker Foundation, um, as well as uh, partially from the Laura Macklin Fund. And on the bottom is uh, Dr. Randy Fennell, who is a retiree who's now using his experience in artificial intelligence to develop new tools in our laboratory related to PKD. So, by, by donations and by gifts and by uh, even in some cases, uh, you know, dedicating time and effort in the laboratory, patients are really making a difference uh, in this disease. And I'll give you more examples uh, later on. So one of the applications that's been made possible as well by one of our partners, the Allen Institute, which is just across the street is using kidney organoids to assess the safety of different drugs. You know, there's many different drugs that fail in late stages of clinical trials because of toxicity to the kidney. 
And it would be very helpful if we could identify these drugs in an early stage and know that they would be toxic before we go through the entire process of drug development. So uh, with help from the Allen Institute, we've developed a live reporter assay, which tells us when a particular molecule is toxic to the kidneys. And we can see this over time by loss of fluorescence. So if you compare the untreated condition on the top to the treated condition at the bottom, you can see that these organoids are sick because they're losing their green signal of GFP. And using this technology, we've now, together with the ice cream Quellos core, performed the largest compound screen to date in kidney organoids, where we screen 160 compounds at two different doses and in duplicate. And we've identified 47 of these compounds having toxic effects at the kidney at one of these doses. And this includes several known nef nephrotoxicants. So the compounds that we screened were investigational compounds or FDA approved compounds, as well as some novel hits that give us some new insight into how kidneys uh, can be adversely affected by drugs. Another futuristic application is the development of gene therapy. So for many of these genetic diseases, it would be great if we could apply a gene therapy to the kidney, but this technology remains in its infancy. So Dr. Nicole Vo, a recent uh, recruit to our laboratory, is studying this by developing, again, with a fluorescence reporter readout, loss of GFP, a technology to target gene therapies to kidney organoids. And uh, you can see here how this is very efficient in undifferentiated iPS cells, but is harder to see in kidney organoids. Nevertheless, using next generation sequencing, we've been able to detect editing events in intact organoids. And this leads us to the idea of whether gene therapy vectors can be used in organoids, such as lentiviruses and adeno-associated viruses. And indeed, we've been able to apply these in our organoids to get efficient transduction, where we're getting gene expression here using fluorescent readouts uh, in places where it wouldn't normally happen using these viruses. And in terms of the elephant in the room, COVID-19, we're also applying similar techniques to study COVID's effects on the kidneys, which are still very poorly understood. And here I'm so showing some, some very preliminary data that we've generated, suggesting that compared to a mock infected culture, our organoids can be infected by a SARS-CoV-2 virus at significant levels. And this happens in as short an exposure time as one hour. So we believe that the kidney effects that are being observed in the clinic from COVID-19 may actually incorporate a role for the virus directly infecting kidney cells based on these experiments. And if so, I think anybody who has kidney disease needs to be aware and extra vigilant when it comes to uh, COVID-19. And we've also found that the receptor for COVID-19, which is ACE2, appears to be expressed in the proximal tubular cells based on RNA readouts. So for the last part of the talk, I just want to focus on one particular disease uh, where we've been studying for the last couple of years, which is cystinosis. And this is a disorder of cysteine accumulation, an amino acid that's normally present in all of our cells and uh, it gets incorporated into the lysosome and normally is transported out by a specific transporter. And in, in these patients, this transporter doesn't work and cysteine builds up within the lysosomes and within the cells. And this causes all sorts of problems with the different organ systems of the body and they affect young children. So it's a very dramatic disorder. And unfortunately, one of the organs that's most affected by cystinosis are the kidneys. And this without treatment results in rapid decline of the kidneys by 10 years of age. It's possible to prolong this somewhat with treatments nowadays, uh, but nevertheless, these patients inevitably require a kidney transplant. And why this should be and how to go about uh, attacking this therapeutically is not yet clear. So we've gotten funding from the Cystinosis Foundation 
to study this disorder in our kidney organoids. And an aspect of this is to establish a biobank of kidney organoids from patients with cystinosis. And we're doing this actively by sending out these kits. Even, even while COVID is going on, we're able to send out these kits. We collect urine in a bottle from the patients and we derive urinary cells. And we reprogram these into IPS cells, which are self-renewing cells. So it's a, it's a permanent resource that we can then distribute to others as well as differentiating these into any tissue that we're interested in. And in our case, of course, we're interested in the kidneys. And these are some examples of these patient cell lines. And to date, we have 10 IPS cell lines or IPS cell lines from 10 patients. Uh, we have hundreds of vials that have been generated using this project and, and we're still collecting more. And as an example of uh, the power of these IPS cell lines, uh, Thomas Vincent, who's a graduate student in the laboratory in the Department of Bioengineering, has implanted stem cells that we've cultured into the kidney organoid state into mice kidneys. And these mouse kidneys form a human graft. So this is just beneath the kidney capsule and endothelial cells, so blood vessels from the mouse kidneys reach out into this human graft and vascularize these structures. And what I'm showing here is a neoglomerulus structure. This is a structure that really looks like kidney tissue, but it's chimeric. It's, it's got a mouse blood vessel and it has human kidney podocytes that are surrounding it. And this is uh, a structure, the type of structure that we don't normally encounter in a dish. It's something that can only be generated uh, in a living organism. And what it suggests is that these cultures do have some capacity to form more functional structures that truly resemble tissue. And if we were do, to do a similar experiment in a human, we might be able to generate new glomeruli from their own cells. I mean, these were cells uh, from a patient that had cystinosis. I'm not suggesting that we do this anytime soon, because as you can see, the rest of the graft is not nearly as impressive. It's got other types of structures in there. So we need to really refine this process. But I think it gives us hope that we may one day be able to use stem cells to provide function to a person in the form of an autologous graft. So I'll wrap up there and just give the overview of how I think this works, um, works out. You know, for the first time in human history, we can regrow primitive kidney structures from our own bodies. And this is opening up many, many new doors. Uh, organoids can be tailored to recreate kidney disorders and predict them uh, using gene editing technology, uh, as well as by adding different elements into the culture conditions. And increasingly, we're using that to predict states and not just recreate them. Patients are playing a starring role in all of this in moving research from bench to bedside. And, and finally, novel drug discovery is possible using this system, including the potential for kidney regeneration in the long term, but in the shorter term, generating new types of drugs that are going to be more safe as well as more efficacious in the kidney pipeline to slow that inexorable progression into kidney failure and reduce the number of people who need end-stage uh, end stage kidney disease renal replacement therapies. So in my last slide, I'd like to again, thank everybody who's been involved in this. I, I, this doesn't even nearly cover everybody who uh, has contributed to the work over the many years, but just uh, a few of our collaborators and, and key supporters within the UW system. Um, Nellie Cruz has really been a right-hand person for me over the past five years. She's now going on to a new position uh, at Columbia and uh, we're very proud of her and wish her the best. Um, but everybody in the lab has really maintained and continued to work hard uh, even during these challenging times of this year. And none of it would be possible uh, without the tremendous support from uh, individuals, foundations, 
and uh, you know, grant applications from our government, as well as the tremendous institutional environment that is uh, present here at the University of Washington. So I'll, I'll end there and say thank you and take any questions. Thank you, Bino. Um, before I turn it over to Alana Crum for questions from the audience, I wanted to thank you for your, your excellent talk. There it was a fine example of fundamental laboratory based translational research. And I also wanted to say that it comes with just, it comes with something more than just a name on a plaque outside my office here. You, you all, Bino will also be receiving a $10,000 honorarium from the uh, Fialco Endowment Fund. So congratulations, Bino. Thank you for pointing that out. I actually meant to point that out myself in the last part of the talk because that allows us to do these types of pioneering experiments and create data quickly for projects like the COVID project. So thank you, Dr. Lyles for bringing that out. And um, I will reiterate again, thank you for such a fantastic talk on really some cutting edge uh, research that you're doing. And for folks in the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, but one question came through, you mentioned um, the use of kind of micrographs from uh, humans into mice. What do you see as limitations of using those sort of organelles or micrographs to um, help improve kidney function in the future in, in um, patients themselves? Well, one big problem is that we need, you know, billions of cells in order to do this. And uh, to, to really get that to work, we're going to need to find a way to expand, not the pluripotent stem cells, but actually those specialized stem cells that uh, give rise to the kidney. And to date, I don't think there's a great way of doing that. Um, so that's one of the limitations. Another, another issue is that we need to make sure that these can function. You know, so once we generate enough of these structures, it's important to show that they can heal a mouse with kidney disease. You know, we're up against a really strong pair of gold standards, which are dialysis and kidney, or kidney transplantation. And I do think that this technology has the potential to be better than, than either of those, but it's gonna take a lot of work. And the, the minimum bar is for us to show that we can make a mouse better uh, by transplanting these cells. And no one in the world has done, has done that yet. Yeah. I think that's a great point of uh, the limitations of translating from, uh, from one step to another is, is in the order of years sometimes as opposed to shorter when we want them. Um, some other questions coming through. Um, could you say a few words about getting flow into the kidney organoids? Right. So that's 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 a challenge because you know these these cells normally grow in a dish. Uh, we've been collaborating with Dr. Himmelfarb, uh, who is an expert in organs on chips that incorporate flow devices. And there's many different strategies you could use to try to get flow into the organoids. Um, and part of this, the, the simplest way to do it is to, to take cells from the organoid and bioengineer them into specific shapes that allow for flow. So you can source organs on chips from organoids. Um, and we've been working towards that. Another, another approach is to try to get uh, a vasculature to somehow invade the organoids um, in the dish. And, and that's, uh, that's still, that's more of a challenge, I would say, in terms of uh, whether that's actually gonna work outside of a living organism. But it's a great, great question and, and one that's always on our minds uh, in terms of how, how to really get the flow because so much of kidney biology is about flow. Our clinical surrogates, our clinical readouts are all flow-based. So we need to be able to see those types of endpoints uh, in our system. And we're just starting a new project to actually, to actually try to do that, uh, funded by NIH uh, NCATS. Good question. Another question coming from the group of, um, do you see a role of poss possibly augmenting transplants with this type of technology? Uh, that's another great question. You know, I, I don't know. I think transplants on, it, on their own are, are very complex and, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that they work, but perhaps 
uh, you could you could see a situation where you know you could optimize the technology for a transplant si situation for example by implanting stem cells in with the transplant at the same time and uh, or, or you could potentially perform genome editing on the transplant to make it more acceptable to the host so these are uh, directions that I think are, are, are pretty futuristic, but I like to think of these therapies as things that can be combined uh, potentially with the existing, existing therapeutic modalities. And that's a great way to enter in to the system. Yeah, um, I have more questions coming in for you. Um, you uh, spoke of roles of organized for two genetic kidney disorders. Um, what strategies, or can you speak to more strategies that you're using for um, exploring kidney regeneration? So uh, the, the question is for these uh, specific disorders or, um, you know, more generally about the kidney regeneration? I think a little bit of both, but more generally the regeneration. Right, so one thing to think about here is, you know, let's say we can regenerate a kidney. We could potentially also modify that kidney to make it so that it doesn't have the original disease. And that's, I think, an attractive idea. So if we, we, we could make a graph that's gene corrected so that when we do put it back into the body, it has abilities that it didn't have before. So that's one of the directions, particularly for these genetic disorders. And that kind of relates also back to the last question. I think that would be very valuable. Um, in terms of the, the kidney regeneration work, uh, I think, like I said before, we're going to need to show that it's, it, it can operate, that it's efficacious, but we also need to find ways to make it safe. These stem cells are powerful uh, medicine, and I think they can therefore come with powerful side effects if we're not careful. And this has plagued other fields in the past, including the gene therapy field, which is only now recovering from some of the missteps of the early days. So, uh, for stem cells, we don't want to by accident cause a tumor yeah. by trying to regenerate a kidney. You know, kidney transplants don't come with a risk of tumorigenesis. So we'd be, we'd be out right there. And this has actually uh, been an issue for other types of organ lineages where iPS cells are, are beginning to be used. Uh, so we're actually seeing this occur, uh, for example, in uh, eye transplants in clinical trials in Japan, where they sometimes have to halt the trials if they see some uh, strange growth. Uh, and even if the medicine works, you know, it's not going to be worth risking the patient uh, getting a tumor. So this is one of the challenges. And I think, again, the key to getting around that is probably going to be uh, controlling and making sure that whatever we implant and what is, is, is pure and scalable. And this goes back to the idea of being able to grow more specific types of stem cells that are uh, committed to turning into kidney as opposed to turning into, uh, you know, a leg or something like that. Yeah, that's a, a, that's a fair point. We don't want to accidentally get a leg when we need a kidney. Um, kind of on uh, a little bit on that point, there's a question of given that an average humans have between uh, half a million to 1.5 million nephrons, how many of these organoids would you envision to be transplanted or implanted? Um, and, and what's your view on their survival? Yeah, so I, you know, we, we, we do, it's, it's a great question. And you know, we have about a million nephrons in our body. We don't need that many in order for, to, to, to have good kidney function, but we probably need, you know, let's say a, a quarter of that amount. So 250,000. And uh, we know that from every cell that we start out with in our dish, um, we get about, uh, you know, an equivalent organoid cell, okay? So uh, if we start with uh, a thousand cells, we potentially have, uh, you know, one or, or, you know, 10 organoids that come out of that. So this is the type of math that we have to do in order to calculate how many cells we need to start with. Um, I think in our case, uh, based on the idea that stem cells can be expanded, you know, we need to start with, uh, you know, uh, tens of millions of cells in order to get a million nephrons. 
But I do think that that is not without, you know, not impossible. We can certainly grow iPS cells up to those numbers without any difficulty. I think the greater challenge is, can we grow stem cells that are committed to the kidney to those numbers? And, and that's, a, that's something that we'll need to work on. Um, but I do think that the types of numbers that we would need in order to uh, generate function in a human body uh, could, be, could be achieved uh, relatively, uh, with, with a relatively small starting number of cells. And uh, the second part of that, that uh, participant's question was, what's your opinion or view on the survival and um, the, the life of, of these organoids? Well, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. They're, they're really tough structures. So they survive in our, in our, in our incubators uh, for, for months, in some cases more than a year. And uh, when they do demise, it's usually due to somebody forgetting to feed them or, you know, eventually getting contamination of some kind. Uh, I think that they're very tough structures. And I think kidney tissue itself is probably pretty tough. And uh, I believe that if we were to implant them, because they would be immunocompatible with the original patient, so we wouldn't need the anti-rejection meds and we wouldn't. I don't think we would need another transplant. I think you could get away probably with one transplant that would last uh, for the rest of a person's life if, if it was done properly. Um, but if, if we needed another transplant, we could probably make a new batch and put them back in. Uh, but, but I think the main reason that we, we have problems uh, with kidneys that are transplanted is because the immune system is constantly attacking those kidneys. And this would give us a way around that problem. That's it. It's a really exciting, uh, it's a very exciting possibilities for sure. Um, another question coming in is, is there any chance of some of these organoids um, becoming de-differentiated? I do think there's a chance of that. And uh, we actually see that, I think, in our grafts. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we've observed is that there's a significant amount of non-kidney tissue that tends to arise in those grafts in the animals. And we think that this non-kidney, we, we purify the cells before we put them in. So we purify only the organoid structures. So we don't think that it's a, a contaminant that's riding along in the beginning. We think that it actually is probably the kidney cells that are changing and de-differentiating and then giving rise to these other types of, uh, you know, off-target, what we call off-target uh, cells like cartilage tissue. So uh, I think the, the structures, when you move them around, have a tendency to change and de-differentiate. We saw that with the PKD model when we popped them off the plate and put them in suspension, that they were more susceptible to disease. And uh, one of the tricks here is going to be implanting them in a way that keeps them happy and secure and doesn't promote this type of de-differentiation. And maybe by using bioengineering approaches, we could, we could actually do that. So one of the things we're, we're working on now in collaboration with the laboratory of Dr. Buddy Ratner is to see whether uh, using scaffolds might give the cells or the stem cells that type of secure environment that will allow them to go in the productive direction instead of the non-productive direction. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing your really interesting work. Um, I'm excited to see where it goes and I appreciate you taking the time to present. And again, congratulations on your, your well-deserved award. So um, thank you and thank you for everyone joining us. Uh, we will be taking next week off for the Thanksgiving break, but the following week, um, Dr. Chris Goss will, will kick us off in, in December. So again, thank you, Dr. Freeman, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to receive this award. Take care.